I am joined here today by someone you might have unknowingly seen in a movie. Um, Kimberly Shannon Murphy is a leading Hollywood stunt woman who has performed in more than 100 feature films and TV shows. She's here with me today to discuss her newest book, Glimmer, a story of survival, hope, and healing, where she talks about her childhood history of abuse um, and her journey of healing dysfunctional family dynamics as she enters into parenthood herself. So you're going to want to listen to this one. She speaks very, very candidly and openly about all of these vulnerable topics. Stay tuned. Kimberly Shannon Murphy, thank you so much um, for joining me. Thank you so much for even offering me to have eyes on your book, your book Glimmer, that we're going to be talking about in just a minute um, before it was published. And like I was sharing with you before we tuned on to sign on to this interview. Um, I was just so struck with how vulnerable you shared so much of your own healing journey and knew that I know, needed to not only endorse the book itself, but to have you on this channel for a conversation, because I know so many of us feel so alone um, in our struggles and you so candidly write about topics that you know aren't necessarily so freely discussed. And in and of itself, I know many of our listeners are going to feel the healing power of being connected um, even through difficult experiences, when we feel a little less alone, at least as far as I'm concerned, um, it, we feel a little more able to look at the difficult things in our life. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for not only putting out your work, the book Glimmer that we're going to be talking about here today, but for sharing your story and your journey here with us now. Thank you. So uh, let's get started. I'm actually interested in uh, the title itself, your book Glimmer with the subtitle, A Story of Survival, hope and healing. Um, what made you name the book Glimmer? I'm interested in in that concept for you and how it, it came to be the title of, of your book. Um, through the writing of my book, the last three years, I realized that my glimmer was actually my inner child. And that came out through the writing. Um, of course, when you do the proposal for the book, you always have these names that I never resonated with me. And that, and I remember my editor just saying, it will all come when it's supposed to. And it, it just did. It just felt like that my, I've been doing a lot of inner child work. And I think that she's always been the one who's kept that spark in me going and who's been pushing me from inside myself without me even knowing. And so my glimmer essentially is my inner child. That's so beautiful. Even hearing you describe it, um, not only its presence, and I imagine we're going to dive all into what we mean when we say inner child, what you meant, how it was for you to come in contact or reconnect with that inner being. And of course, heal. Um, and really interestingly, kind of hearing you describe it as, as a sparkle, um, and acknowledge not only their presence, but um, just from a clinical lens, uh, glimmers in polyvagal theory, which a lot of my work is, you know, kind of touches on are actually signals of safety. Um, so it's kind of ironic, I think, in so many ways that you're describing this inner spark of being and of course, a, a being that as we dive into this conversation, wasn't necessarily kept safe. Um, but seeing that reflected in in your book, I think was really what drew me to even asking this question. So let me ask you what Three years ago, um, what kind of inspired you to put your story down um, as you did in, in the pages of a book? Um, why three years ago? Why a book in general? I've been wanting to write a book for 20 years, but not in the headspace to do it. And I, my family system in general is extremely toxic. A lot of people have chosen not to do the healing work. And so I think for a long time, being a part of my family system was more important than taking care of myself. I can see that now when I couldn't see that then. Um, so when COVID happened, I don't do well sitting still um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> so I just said, this is the time I'm just going to do it. And I found a ghostwriter and everything just happened really easily. It was almost like the universe was just sort of guiding me that this was the right time to do it. And so we did a proposal and we, you know, you know, all the things you have to do to kind of sell a book. And when we were looking for comps for my book, we couldn't find any. And going through the process of writing it, I now know why, because <laughs> 
the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. And then that really, I think when I started writing the book, I thought that I had done so much work, which I had, I had done so much therapy and I had done a lot of work on myself, but I hadn't really done as much work as I thought. And so going through the process of writing the book and reading the words on the page that were my life. And then now when we did the audiobook and hearing someone else, I didn't read it. I had one of my actresses read it because it was just too emotional for me to, I didn't want the engineer to be there for three years trying to get the words out of my mouth. Um, just hearing someone speak your life is very surreal. And it made me have a lot of revelations of how how neglected I was, how abused I was, how little support was available to me. And it made me reevaluate a lot of relationships in my life. Yeah. Thank you um, for sharing all of that. And, you know, all topics that I think we're going to dive into, you know, from kind of the work you chose, you know, um, to do what you did, this idea of the toxic family and, you know, kind of coming to these realizations, these truths and all that you've had to navigate and hearing that come up again in, in terms of writing the book and what was the actual, you know, kind of process like as you began to, you know, unearth, I guess, again, these stories, because what you're talking about, I think is going to resonate with a lot of us, um, whether or not it's kind of us retelling or going into a deeper level of healing, you know, based on past experiences that maybe we've come to the awareness of at some point in the past, or, you know, a lot of people I will often hear, you know, oh, I, I'm feeling like I'm at, you know, some kind of groundedness or state of healing. And then I find or find my way into this new relationship or a specific relationship, or I go back to my, you know, family relationships and I'm then hit again with a wash of all of this stuff again. So what was, I mean, what do you make of, the process for you and kind of revisiting it and um, what were the the difficult aspects of it aside from kind of hearing of someone else tell your story how was it for you to I guess go back down this memory lane in this very directed way with the intention of knowing I think that's another yeah. part of it right that it's going to go in these pages of a book um, did you have I'm just thinking of my own process I know for me sharing you know a lot of my own journey in in my past book and a book I'm working on now I internally had moments, like you're saying, worrying about protecting, you know, other people and how are they going to receive it? For me, that was very strong. Um, yes. And there was like an internal sensor, even as I was writing the words on the page and revisiting on myself and feeling all the feelings about that having happened. And then another voice in my head wondering if I should tone it down, if I should word it a different <laughs> way or shift it or remove it entirely, because how will it be for it to not only be in front of strangers' eyes, but you know, family members or other people that were closer to me. So I don't know if you had a similar experience or how is it that I guess then you navigate it, not only having these feelings coming up, but this, you know, reality of other people going to lay eyes on so much of your childhood. Yeah. yeah. It's really, I think when I got a book, when I got the book deal, um, I felt like I needed to call all of my family and just get this validation from them that it was okay that I was doing this, that it was okay that I was telling my story, that that I that I needed that support from them at the time. And as I started making the phone calls, because in the book we have a fictitious sister in my in my in the book, but I actually have three sisters. And so my one sister who we had very different childhoods because we're very far apart in years. And um, since my abuser died when I was 11, we just didn't have a similar childhood. Um, her reaction to me was, you're going to ruin everyone's life. You're going to ruin all the kids' lives. Like you're, you're hurting me. I, and that was her reaction to it. And I just felt like I needed to make everything okay for her. And she was worried about how I was going to depict my father in the book. And then my other sister completely just ghosted me. I haven't talked to her since I got my book deal. Um, and I think that those things needed to happen for me because I needed to really see how toxic my family was still and they, and the toxicity that we were all still existing in and that I was still participating in it. And so some of them chose to walk away from me and I chose to walk away from some of them. And I think I needed that in order to actually write my truth 
the way that I did, because if I was constantly worried about what someone was going to feel or someone was going to say, I wasn't able to fully speak my truth. With that said, I didn't write the book to hurt anybody. I wrote the book to help survivors. I mean, I, I feel like we did a really good job. My main goal was I don't want to be super triggering to anybody who's been through similar abuse. I want to write it in a way where you understand the severity of the abuse, but it's not out there in plain, bold letters so that the people that I'm trying to help just close the book and put it away. I want this to be a book for people like me to be able to go to and feel inspired that you can get through something so horrific and you can get to the other side and you can heal and that it's all a process. But I think I needed to do that without the people that made me sick in the first place. Yeah. I want to commend you um, for your strength, your courage, your resilience to you know, be faced with again, another really pivotal moment of making that choice of standing in your own truth um, with the passion and purpose behind it, like you're beautifully describing and we're tending to, or the other kind of voice in the head of concerns about tending to other people. And I know then when we're wired and I talk often about, you know, our actual nervous system and these states of protection that are quite literally, you know, wired into our mind and body, it becomes really difficult as logically as, you know, I can profess from the rooftop how important your truth is and to stand in, you know, your narrative and affirm yourself, regardless of what people think. The reality of it is it's really difficult to do that, especially when, you know, this this trauma, this coping mechanism even of deferring to other people is is so ingrained in us, which really brings me to that you, you did a wonderful job, um, I think, in terms of, um, you know, actualizing that purpose. I, I was just so struck. Um, you can't see in front of me, but I have two whole sheets um, with just beautiful <laughs> quotes, um, the way I'm just such, such, such a sucker for words and quotes and the way you word it and talked about and navigate it, talking about and languaging some really difficult topics was, I mean, a word I will dare say is, was beautiful um, in my opinion. And um, I imagine that many readers, you know, who have been through a similar experience, my hope is that exactly like you're intending, um, you did kind of word your journey in a way that, you know, could feel approachable. Um, and like I said, even kind of giving language that is so, so touching um, to such difficult topics. And one of the things that struck me from the beginning, even just kind of diving into now, what I even mean when I say kind of wired into us and, you know, our experiences of this past really do come with us, even if we're, you know, away and we've cut relationships with these toxic humans, a lot of those patterns still are ingrained in us. And you write in the book, um, long before I had memories, I had my dolls. I cared for them and I protected them. I think I envied them for getting to be pretty and safe. We were a lot alike, perfection on the outside, hollow on the inside. What had bought we had bodies but no free will. Histories we couldn't speak of, but carried in our fibers. I have chills reading this. Um, I'm really struck by this, you know, kind of pretty and safe, right? And kind of how, you know those two concepts, you know, played into your child experience and also this kind of juxtaposition of, right, this idea of what we're showing on the outside yet internally this, and I really resonate personally with a feeling of, of hollowness, of course, for different historical reasons, though, that really, really struck me. Um, of course, in addition to this idea of we live our histories, even if we don't have conscious knowledge, and even if it isn't part of our shared family narrative, which I know was a big part um, of your journey. So can you speak a little bit of, you know, kind of that quote and, you know, kind of that, that feeling early in childhood before even you, I think, you know, were made aware of these deep rooted, um, this history, if you will, that you couldn't speak of, but that you carried and what kind of that early stage, I think it comes in even, I'm interested in the three names of the parts that you split yeah. the book up. It comes in this idea of splitting, right? This idea that there's two internal, external, um, external, I just made up a word, um, or <laughs> like, right, these ideas that there's these two, you know, aspects of myself, um, two even realities, right? The deeper suppressed one of what was actually happening. And then the reality that everyone was kind of tending to or acknowledging that wasn't necessarily actually happening around you. Yes. I think there was a lot of confusion for me because my abuse started so young. I was probably two or three when it started. I didn't know any other life, but I knew that it didn't feel right or good or okay. 
And it was really confusing to me because not only was this horrific thing happening to me and on a very regular basis, because I saw my grandfather often, but that the adults in my life weren't doing anything about it. And so to me, I think I just had this sense of, well, this is life. This is just what it is. This is what we do. This is kind of quote unquote, my job. Um, I didn't know any other way. And so even though deep down, it didn't feel good or right. I didn't, I couldn't explain in my four-year-old head or five-year-old head. And it, it, in any other way, then this is just what every family must do. This is just what must happen because anything else was too mature for me to wrap my head around at that stage of my life. Um, so I feel like in that sense, I was always been the truth teller in the family, which has caused a lot of kind of rift and, and growing up in a family where everyone wants to stuff everything under the rug and just sort of move on. And, and it really started with my grandmother and her perfectionism. And I come you know, now I, I feel like there are names for things that there weren't names for back then, or at least I didn't know the names for them. And I grew up with a, many narcissists, obviously, and there was so much gaslighting and so much manipulation happening. And it feels good now as an adult to be able to look at those words and the definitions and understand that that's what was happening to me. And then that what was actually going on in my life and there's an actual clinical word for it and it's actually abuse. Um, so not only was I dealing with, and it's interesting because, you know, Dr. Matei, who's become a good friend of mine and um, been amazing through my process as well, said something to me and I write this in the book too. He said, you know, our first conversation and he said, I want you to know that your first trauma was not your abuse that it was your first trauma was that you were separated from any adult support, which is how the abuse happened in the first place. And when he said that, it sort of turned my world upside down because I've still been yearning to have these relationships with these adults who ultimately didn't protect me and weren't there physically, mentally for because of their own trauma. And that's the whole point of me really having this importance of writing my story because you pass it on to your children in any way. And, and it may not be the sexual abuse, but it's the, it's the trauma from the sexual abuse and how that manifests inside of you. And then how you then raise your children or your partner or whoever you're with in your life. And that was a really big one that took me a little that took me a minute to swallow that. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine. I appreciate you sharing that um, here with us, Kimberly, and what you're describing, even going back to right this this instinctual feeling you had as a child, right? You know, at an at an age like more like beginnings of preverbal, right, shifting into just getting language for the first time, and you know when overwhelming events happen at that age, not only can't we can't describe it to ourselves. Like you said, we don't have the maturity to zoom out and understand all the dynamics that have created the circumstances of suffering, of abuse that we've experienced. Yet internally, we have that feeling of something's not right. But in absence of that being reflected by the you know external narrative, by someone acknowledging and supporting how not right it is or affirming that intuition, we'll defer because we need those caregivers. We're physically dependent on them. We're emotionally dependent on them. So our our feelings, our instincts get squashed beneath the surface. And we then believe what's happening around us based in that set state of dependency. And also like you're describing, based in our lack of emotional maturity. And I think it's really interesting and notable. I appreciate you not only acknowledging you know, the fact that you you suffered at the hands of, of abuse, right? So there was a perpetrator, if you will, though you're also highlighting and expanding the focus to the whole system. I mean, you, you know, you began by acknowledging I come from a toxic family system and you're, you know, kind of as Dr. Mate kind of brought to your own awareness that there were other people around, right? Either that were blind to this or weren't creating the safety 
for you to be able to engage a conversation or bring your reality to light sooner than you did. And I think sometimes, you know, because of course, you know, focus and acknowledging the perpetrator and the abuses is part of the healing journey, though. It's it's not as often that I see people so readily saying, though, it was everyone else involved. And, you know, a lot of times I hear, you know, we have an explosive parent and, oh, well, you know, the parent who's not as explosive or the, you know, kind of go with the flow parent gets kind of highlighted as, you know, being valiant because they're not exploding, but it's, well, what are they doing when the explosions are happening? And it still is a form of, of abuse. And you actually, again, I'm very res much resonating with the way you describe your mom um, in yeah. particular. And you say she, mom, um, looks back with nothing. It's that look I've known my entire life. You could snap your fingers in front of her face and she wouldn't even blink. I always thought that she was tired. It never occurred to me that she was this way before even us. It dawned on me, mom was a little girl once, a little girl let down by her mother. And I'm resonating having a very similar mom who was so dissociated um, based on events that you know predated even any of my siblings who are very much like your own experience, much older in age. Um, though coming to that reality and you know having that awareness, I think really describes what you're just you're talking about here, which is it wasn't just the perpetrator. It was, it was mom. And how was that for you to, you know, come to that realization that mom wasn't, or, you know, at least in the way you describe it here, wasn't present to you is kind of the language that my mind hears when I read this quote. Uh, yeah, my mom, um, it's been, that's been a difficult one for me because my mom really tries and she's been in therapy for a really long time. But as I always say, you can be in therapy for 50 years. And if you're not working with the right person, you're not healing. So um, I think that that's a difficult thing. My mom, it's, it's almost like she has acknowledged, obviously acknowledged everything that has happened. It happened to her. Um, but I do feel she's the one person in the family who I still do talk to. Um, and we've done a lot of therapy together. We've done a lot of work together. You know, I, I, I did leave things out in the book. Um, one, which I wasn't going to speak about, but have openly spoken about, which I think is important. Um, when we speak about the grooming of the perpetrator and how strong that actually is on a child, um, there was a few times that my mom did walk in when things were happening to me and he had so much control over her that she, he told her to leave and she did. And so again, for me as a child, just having that moment is like, okay, well, this is just what we do. And mom obviously is okay with it. But in my mom's words, if you were to speak to her now about it, she doesn't, you know, it was just like, you know, nothing was there. It was just, he had abused her so long and, and in her life that he had this control over her like nobody else. And so that is what enabled him to be able to do it to me because he knew that he could control her and, uh, you know, he didn't abuse me when I was by myself. He abused me at parties. I mean, people were upstairs, people were around. It wasn't like, you know, I was dropped off and in a room with him and things were happening. It was like, there was many adults around when this was going on. And that's why I talk a lot about just in general, you know, know where your kids are, like know where they are. I mean, I don't care how well, you know, somebody, I just, you know, I have a daughter now so that's obviously been really um, sort of the catalyst for me writing this book too, because I feel like it's so important for her to, you know, obviously when it's appropriate in her life, for her to know my story, for her to know where I come from so that she can understand that, you know, mommy may have overreacted in this situation, but I can understand why. And that I'm working on myself and I am doing my best. And I do think that so often as parents, we want to just shove everything down and think that that's the best way to do things. And then just say, okay, well, this happened and I'm just moving on. And I'm now I'm going to be a parent and I'm 
I'm going to parent my child. And I, I have watched that happen in, in my family with my family's children and it doesn't fare well. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. And again, I you know want to continue to acknowledge the, the bravery to, you know, begin to engage these, these conversations, because for so many of us, you know, your mom even included, like you're sharing, um, it becomes just what we do, right? We get so afraid of, and in those moments brought right back to the, the moments where we were a child and dependent and unable to exert a different level of boundaries and power and say, no, I'm not leaving what's happening here. Right. And I think that that story, um, or that moment, you know, that was incredibly painful for you, you know, kind of from mom's lens, you know, it's really illustrates how that and all of the trauma stored in her own body can override, right? Something even objectively real um, yeah. that she, you know, entered into. And then you kind of go into more and you describe, um, you know, this early tendency um, to, you know, that you taking on the role of what you you say is kind of trying to ease mom worries, mom's worries. And you acknowledge, I'm still a good girl, mostly. My priorities are simple and automatic. Again, this idea of automatic, really describing how these are wired. They're just our instincts. They're what we do. And for a significant part of your years, um, your priorities, simple and automatic, were staying alive, excelling at cheerleading, dance, or gymnastics, um, and trying to ease mom's worry. So all of this, again, just kind of speaks to how instinctual you were kind of feeling what was happening. You were feeling the need to ease mom's worries, the need to, you know, perform and excel in these certain ways um, as not only your means to stay alive, but to stay safe. I think for a lot of us, you know, in childhood, we develop adaptations, which might be performing like you did. And can you say a little bit of, you know, how it was that, you know, gymnastics and um, that kind of physical practices of um, cheerleading and dance and everything that you engaged in, kind of what role you think, looking back now, that played um, for you so early on um, in terms of not only easing mom's worries, but maybe navigating what was happening for you um, internally in the home? I think it gave me an identity. I think that for a really long time, I didn't know who I was without my grandfather. I didn't have an identity without him because I was introduced to the abuse at such a young age. So I didn't know who I was without him. And I know that sounds really twisted, but um, when he died, I almost didn't know what to do with myself. Although I had so much feeling of relief and, and happiness and confusion as to why I wasn't sad, but I wasn't sad. Um, but I think it gave me a nice a sense of identity and I think also, interestingly enough, I think it was subconsciously a coping mechanism for me. Um, Dr. Bruce Perry had said to me on one of our conversations, you know, you were healing yourself without even knowing it just by moving your body and all the things that you were doing in a healthy way. You know, so many of us, when we've had abuse, there's vast amount of things that can happen, obviously addiction and, you know, I had bulimia. I was a cutter. I did some things that were not positive, but I think dance and gymnastics were a positive outlet for me to get my emotions out. And I'm really struck by you describing um, your identity, right? Being connected um, within this relationship with your, with your grandfather. And I, you know, I, I think it's very understandable when we're in childhood, you know, we're ho hypothetically, right. Needing to have a free, safe, secure space to begin to explore humans who are curious about who we are many times, right. Based on how we're interacting with them, simply to say, we learn who we are. We do develop our identity in relationship with those core caregivers that we're reliant on. So, you know, from that psychological lens, when we, you know, talk about this, you know, very elusive concept, sense of self and identity and where that comes from. I mean, you're very beautifully describing the reality of it. We're not solo on an island when we're born. We're actually embedded in at least one primary relationship with whoever the caregiver is that is, you know, tasked with keeping us physically alive, though often we're embedded in a dynamic relationship with a family, with other people. Like you're saying, this was someone who I spent consistent time with. So I think through that lens, it's really understandable and astute for you to kind of acknowledge that there was part 
of my identity that was kind of adhered to the abuse that happened before me. And you you go on um, again to another, I, I feel like I'm plucking a lot of comments that, you know, I, for very different historical reasons, again, resonate with personally. And another aspect of your identity you comment on um, when you kind of catch yourself, I think, apologizing for something and you say, why am I apologizing? I've been working on this. Um, this is when, you know, a shift has happened in terms of your awareness of the abuse at this part of the book and you beginning your healing journey. So why am I apologizing? I've been working on this. I know why I say star sorry for every damn thing. It's because deep down, I blame myself for what he did. I also blame myself for causing my family pain by stirring the pot and making them look at the reality of our past. My sorriness is stored in my bones. I want it out. Um, so again, kind of highlighting these identities and even this responsibility version of an identity that I do think a lot of victims um, carry with them that they don't necessarily talk about, you know, because it, it feels like to blame myself for what happened to me. And like, how could I do that? I'm a child. And, you know, that mature part of our mind zooms in and is like, well, you shouldn't do that. Um, though in reality, I think what you're describing is a very real part of the identity process, which is that we do assume a level of responsibility. Um, and you describe it so beautifully. Thank you. Yeah, I think that I always felt that I didn't have shame and I didn't have guilt for what was done to me because in my brain I didn't. And I didn't realize how much it was actually just stored in my system and that it was coming out in these other ways because it's very easy to say, oh, I know it wasn't my fault. I know that I didn't do anything wrong. I know. Well, of course, you know that because you were a child and this person was an adult and this was not okay. And that's what the world says, but it doesn't mean that it's not stored somewhere in your body and coming out in different ways. And I think such an important thing. And I think why it's so difficult for people to really get to a healing space when you've gone through something so dramatic, traumatic is because we cannot heal around the people that have made us sick. And that doesn't mean that I'm, when I speak about my family, I know my grandfather was the catalyst and the person who made me sick, who, who, who did this abusive, you know, thing to me over and over and over again. But then the family starts moving in this toxic, you know, sort of way. And when I started branching off and and trying other things and other healing methods and doing other other sort of work, I it almost felt like I was standing under an umbrella alone, and I just wanted like all my family to like get under the umbrella. And you know, I'm like over here going like, no, come over here, like we can do this, like it's it's actually possible. We don't have to live like this, and we don't have to walk on eggshells around each other and be triggered all the time. And, and, and we can do this in a safe space. And I realized very quickly that I could not do that. And that was dif a difficult one for me, for sure. Can you say a little more about that as you're, you know, shifting it into healing? Um, because I, you're describing, I think very natural and something I hear quite often um, from members of the community, which is a very understandable, like want to bring our loved ones under the umbrella, especially if we know that, you know, they were part of these dysfunctional um, cycles. So um, how was, you know, kind of what were the moments when you came to realize or, you know, what were the factors that helped you and how was it then to come to that? You know, what can many of us be a really devastatingly disappointing, reopening up a wound in, in a lot of ways um, moment or choice points of like, well, what am I going to do now? You know, I can have this want and at the same time I can see what's, you know, happening in reality. Yeah. I think with my father, it was very difficult. I haven't spoken to him now in a year. Um, and he was a difficult one for me because realizing that my dad is a complete narcissist was something that I really had to come to terms with. And he did not have an easy life. And this is what I mean about the trauma just passing down. He didn't have an easy life and went to Vietnam when he was 18 and was in the war for two years. And then when he came out, he never did any work to sort of deal with it or, you know, utilize the VA in any way. And so I know that he lived with a lot of pain and a lot of 
scarring because of that. Um, but I think a, it's a generational thing. I think that generation isn't doing what this generation is doing. Thank God. Um, and with him, it was difficult because I would get on the phone and I would try to have these conversations with him and they were never conversations. It was just him, you know, kind of like a broken record saying the same thing over and over. And, and with that said, he was supportive of me writing the book and saying, you know, I think it's going to help a lot of people and I think you should do it. Um, but we were always having the same conversations and nothing was ever being resolved from them. And so something had happened over the summer where my daughter was affected and in sense of she was left out because nobody wanted to be around me. And so I had to explain to her, you know, to sit there with my eight-year-old. And for that was the moment for me that changed everything because I saw my family's trauma bleeding out onto my child who asked for none of this. And it was the exact thing I was fighting for. And now I had to have a conversation with her because of it that I didn't want to have to have. But because she was left out in her eight-year-old mind, she said, mommy, what did I do? Why doesn't anyone want to see me? Why can't I see my cousins? I love my cousins, mommy. I'm so, uh... so it was such a painful moment as a parent but also such an eye-opening moment for me to acknowledge that, no, this stops like right here. She is not going to feel a sliver of how I grew up, a sliver of, of this is my fault. What did I do? Because she's a beautiful human with a beautiful heart and she's a child and she deserves to feel loved and safe and accepted and all of the things that I never was. And so for me, I kind of just sat down and I wrote my father a letter because I knew trying to talk to him about it wasn't going to happen. And I, you know, sort of said all the things, you know, these are the things that happened when I was a child that really have now affected me and I'm trying to work through them. And I left the letter saying, you know, there's options we can heal, dad. This is not, I'm not saying goodbye to you. I'm saying we have to do things differently or I can't do them at all. And I never heard back from him after that. Thank you for um, sharing that again. As I imagine, you know, bringing that to mind, um, I can even hear the emotion in your voice. And I want to acknowledge you yet again, Kimberly, for your your choice in that moment, um, as difficult as it was to honor what your truth was, to, you know, tell your very young daughter the the reasons to give her you know, the explanation of why she's having the experience of disconnection, of distance, of people not wanting to be present in her life, because that's a gift. Um, I think a lot of us, you know, we we think for very well-intentioned reasons that we're protecting our children by, you know, not telling them certain things, though, much like in your own childhood, when you don't have someone explaining to you why things are happening that are, you know, causing you suffering or why anything that's happening, we don't have that level of understanding, we will come up with an explanation. And when we're in those prime developmental years, that the version of the explanation that we're going to land on is is not that it's not my fault. It's actually the way you you know beautifully, as we just talked about, it's that there is something inherently wrong with me. I'm the cause of mm -hmm. these behaviors because developmentally we can't understand otherwise. So parents like yourself who are having difficult conversations and and telling our kids, you know, another version of of a reason why she's having those painful experiences of disconnection is such a, a, such a great gift. And I think this invites us to talk a bit about, you know, kind of your, your process of getting, you know, finding out that, you know, you, you were pregnant as you're beginning to acknowledge, like we talked earlier of your inner child and right. This space where all of this wounding from this past, you know, is housed within you and all of these coping tendencies um, that you've developed over the years from disconnection to right. Channeling it in what could be, you know, functional or adaptive society, you know, ways of being active and also some, some non-adaptive ones kind of really, again, highlighting all of this trauma inside of you and now becoming to realize that you have this inner child space, this glimmer, and it's carrying the wounding and also the spark that is you. And now you're being given the information, right? You have another, you have a child along, coming along and now you are going 
to be the parent. And you, again, as you've done throughout the book, um, you touch on, I think, uh, an important conversation for other, you know, women to hear, expectant mothers, people who are, you know, already mothers themselves, um, something that's not so talked about, which is what is the impact then of, of your own past when you, you know, are having your own child and you write um, about nursing. And the first time we tried nursing, my abuse memory surged up from deep inside of me. The closeness, the sensations, the feeling of giving one's body over to another can call, can trigger flashbacks, stress hormones, even dissociation. And again, I want to just thank you for so candidly describing that, you know, this very joyous occasion, right? That many of us, I think, shame ourselves out of when we do have these experience of it not being joyous, of it being difficult, of it even as you have had the experience of bringing up, right, these very difficult, painful moments. So can you speak to a little bit about kind of what your journey of finding out that you were pregnant, kind of, you know, getting ready to have this, this child come into your life, knowing this kind of history that you've carried, you know, into this experience and also these moments early on, which, which weren't as joyous as I think so many of us anticipate parenthood to be were actually quite difficult. Oh yes. So difficult. I, when that started happening with the breastfeeding, that really was devastating for me. Um, I feel, I felt like, you know, I had done so much work and that he was just like following me and that he was never going to go away. And that was really hard. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. I mean, thank you for um, allowing your emotions to to be so present here. And like I said, I have the idea that a lot of listeners are going to be greatly impacted. I mean, maybe their you know journeys are going to be unique to them, but I do think um, these are moments where you know we're with a child, we are you know you know trying to be that cycle breaker, and and here comes right this past is not only a reminder of what happened to us, but you know, yeah. I'm sure fear, full of in a lot of ways fear and like, well, what happens now? And, you know, how do I provide this nutrient or what happens now logistically, um, you know, in terms of feeding yeah. my child to what happens emotionally, you know, because then it gets, it does get complicated. Now you have this little being with all of this hope and, you know, desire to carry all of these beautiful things you've been doing for your own healing and your own inner child into this relationship. And it, it does. And it can feel like quicksand, like, well, wait a minute. Now I'm, I don't have that traction um, that I once had. And again, I just want to thank you for allowing the emotion of it to come forward because I've spoken and worked with a lot of, you know, parents, mothers in particular who carry so much shame um, for admitting these, these moments um, where their past does come to wash um, them in the present in these, you know, again, moments of what's supposed to be or anticipated to be something emotionally completely different um, than what's actually happening. And I I think it's more humans like yourself that are being honest in these ways that are, you know, going to relieve uh, the shame that so many carry when these moments are part of the reality. Uh, much like when we enter into romantic partnerships, like I was kind of sharing earlier, and we reach new levels of healing. I mean, when we have a child, <laughs> I mean, talk yeah. about our own inner child and us going right back um, to childhood and having not only more consistently those older patterns at the ready but these really acute moments of overwhelming emotion. And I think too, that's why it's so important. We've gotten into a society too with the whole breastfeeding thing. And when that happened to me, I I think it's so important not to judge how people do things and you have no idea what might be going on for them. I tried to push through it with her. Um, and just kind of said to myself, okay, you can deal with whatever's going on. You can still breastfeed her. But I saw her getting anxious. Like, you know, she was an infant and I could feel her feeling my anxiousness. And for that, in that moment, her being so little, it was really incredible to me. I'm like, wow, this little being can feel already she can't even talk. She can't, you know, there's a million things she can't do. She can't survive on her own, but she can feel my, my anxiousness. And so I just stopped breastfeeding altogether and I started pumping and that's how, you know, I wanted to continue to give her breast milk. And that was for both of us, the um, 
emotionally the safest way that we could do it. And again, I want to just commend you because that, that is quite a difficult decision, especially with all of the information that, you know, we get around these particular parenting decisions and what we need to do. And, you know, to speak to your point, I mean, children, just like you are at some time, we are feeling beings. We are yeah. so attuned, um, oftentimes more so than the adults around us because they've become so disconnected and squash that intuition, you know, for all the conditioned reasons um, though children are that pure state of awareness. And again, making that choice to acknowledge that I might wish this wasn't, wasn't the case. I might be armed with all of the information of why I need to you know, make this choice, you know, such that it's a breastfeeding, the, the radical honesty, quite literally, that you've had to have with yourself to say, you know what, my body is sending the opposite signal that I want my body to be sending in that moment that then my child needs in that moment, which is safety and security so that they can even process the nutrients that your, you know, body is giving them and really having that moment of reckoning where, you know, we do look and it's of no fault of your own, of no ill intention. You were honoring your body that was carrying that wisdom that was saying, you know, this doesn't feel safe for me right now. It has nothing to do with the child at all, though it, allowed you to live into, I think that most aligned choice, um, which for societal reasons, for conditioning reasons, you know, because we're holding ourselves up to an expectation. So few of us, I think, and I think more and more people are beginning to honor um, what their body is saying, armed with now the information that, you know, those signals, that stress that you felt, you know, evidenced yeah. and felt and saw maybe in your child's body is impacting the child. And so being, I think, brutally honest allowed you um, to make the choice that created then that safe um, container of experience, even if it was through the bottle, not what you intended intended or hoped um, yeah. it to be through. And I think, again, that's just such a testament to attuned parenting, um, to really being present to kind of what we are, where we are, how we are, how we're feeling, and knowing that those are going to be communicated, those states um, of stress, of overwhelm, of disconnection. Even if we wish it weren't the case, um, if it's still stored in our bodies, um, it is the case. So as, you know, past this um, period of time where she was, you know, so little, so dependent, um, kind of what else have you seen in terms of your parenting journey, um, acknowledging that, again, you have your own inner child, right, that you're continuing to show up in service of, and now you have a developing, I think you said she's eight years old now. Um, were there any other, I guess, moments or periods in terms of parenting in and of itself where, um, you that you found particularly challenging based on again your own your own history your own past I think the biggest thing that I try to do with her and I say this quote in the book and I say it when I in my when I'm young which is the truth feels so good why don't we say it more and it it's such a simple thing but it's so true and I've learned that with her because she's an amazing being. And she's just this honest, wants to know all the things. And I've just really tried to do the exact opposite of what I was. I, I don't even want to say taught because I think I just learned from watching of what, how things were supposed to be, or, you know, what my life looked like at that time. Um, so we just have a policy in this house where we always tell the truth. And as long as we tell the truth, we never get in trouble. And we have a open and honest and loving relationship. And I think the biggest lesson for me with her, especially when it came to my family, was having her understand that just because you're an adult does not mean that you are a healthy adult does not mean that you're doing the right thing, does not mean that what you say is right, does not mean the way you're treating a child is right. I think that that's been my biggest lesson with her because I was taught, well, this is, we respect our elders. This is just what we do. And it doesn't matter what they're doing to you or how they're treating you. This is what you do. And so I've done the opposite with her where I say to her, just because it's your aunt or just because it's an adult doesn't mean they're making good choices and doesn't mean they're making the right decision. And when we're hurt as a child, if we don't work through it and deal with it, it comes out in our adult life. And unfortunately it comes out on other people. And that's why mommy surrounds you with people that don't do those things. When she asks questions, because obviously her 
her cousins were in her life for a long time. So she's had a lot of confusion around, okay, why all of a sudden is this, they're not in my life and I miss them and I love them as do I, but I try to help her understand that, you know, it's such a cliche thing to say, but her people hurt people and it's just true. And if you are not doing the work and you're not healing yourself, it is ultimately going to bleed out in every aspect of your life. And that's just the reality of it. So that's kind of our mantra in the home. I'm just so inspired, uh, Kimberly, from the the honesty to, again, the reality that so much is, I think, in terms of these conditioned beliefs where, whether it's cultural or based on, again, a certain age, I do think we've taught children to defer, right, to the world around us, to the adults around us, to the media around us, right, to what the people of the block are doing or think we should be doing around us, or even our teachers, what they're saying that we should be doing. Um, and I, you know, those, those moments of wisdom where you're not only communicating that um, to your child, though you're living, you know, into that, um, into your own honest truth, into, you know, speaking so directly and candidly um, about your own healing and pain and the patterns as they continue to affect you, as I always say, until we become conscious of, of, you know, what is creating the decisions and the habits and patterns that are driving our daily life, we can't make those changes, even if we very much want to, um, showing up in service of breaking these patterns and teaching our future generations differently really comes in in action in these yeah. moments where you're being honest, in these moments where you're, you know, teaching through lived experience of, you know, honoring your child when they come, when she comes to you with whatever is happening and not just telling her to squash, squash that intuition herself. And um, as we get ready to end here, I, I want to kind of affirm and attest to you. Um, you write a question or muse a question in in your book, um, probably on around the time when you just were finding out you were getting pregnant and or were very newly into motherhood. And you kind of acknowledge what your real fear is. And your real fear, you go on to say, is what if I do nothing? What if nothing I do will be enough to protect this child? What if the curse of, is it Earl? Earl Avenue follows my baby too. And I want to hear affirm you that, I mean, you are doing what you need to do to protect your child. And it's not necessarily, as I think so many of us think, right, while you are shifting and changing dynamics and putting up boundaries, what you're doing, at least in my language, is you're teaching your child resilience to trust herself, her instincts, how she can begin to then speak her truth, not only to you, her, you know, safe, protected, secure caregiving space now, though, over time, she will have that resilience to affirm herself and to know when it is that she needs to make different choices to protect herself. So I want to honor um, everything you've done in your own healing journey, um, all of the ways that that will, in my opinion, greatly impact um, your child. And now the gift that you've given not only listeners of, of this channel here, though, really the whole global collective in putting out your new book, which I'm just holding up for anyone who is <laughs> viewing this, um, Glimmer. Um, really, like I said, when we began this talk, I'm just so inspired um, by your story, by your journey, by how much you share of it between these pages. Um, and I know that other survival survivors like yourself who get their hands on this book, not only will they feel, feel less alone, um, I imagine they'll come away feeling inspired with hope um, that they too can begin to break. If they had that same fear, you know, am I going to just keep these cycles going? Um, you really do send a resounding um, hope and possibility to all of us that no, you don't have to. You can show up in different ways by making new choices, by having hard conversations, by learning and teaching then skills and modeling new ways of being. And quite literally, in my opinion, you can not only change our future generations, but create, you know, and and impact humans to change, um, in my opinion, the world around it, around us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for pouring yourself um, into this work, for pouring this work out into the world and for taking the time to have a chat with me today about all of it. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.